assessments and leadership. Um, this is the first of two sessions on the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership. So thank you so much for joining this early morning session. Before we get started, just a few technical matters. Um, one is that there is interpretation for this um, session. So please do choose the language um, that you would like to listen to the session in at the bottom in the globe icon. Um, I will ask my panelists to please unmute yourself and turn on your cameras uh, in order to go on stage and to make your presentations. Um, audience members, please note that you can ask questions in the question function throughout the session. Um, so we do encourage you to do so. If you can see the Q&A right there at the bottom, um, please do ask us any questions. So beyond those technical matters, my name is Hakima Abbas. I'm the co-executive director of AWID, a global feminist movement support and membership organization uh, with over or close to 7,000 members in 180 countries. As a movement support organization, we are really excited to be moderating this panel on the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership and to have been working as a member of the Count Me In Consortium with colleagues from different sectors from around the world on the Action Coalition for the last almost year now. It's been 25 years since Beijing um, and we have even more evidence that autonomous feminist movements are the key drivers of social change. Whether we're building spaces free from violence or rebuilding economies that count for all people's needs. We have also in this time of the pandemic seen how game-changing feminist leadership is in responding to crises. Yet all of the data shows that feminist movements still receive a very paltry amount of funding. Um, and even more than that, the feminist movement and leaders at all levels are subject to violence, threat and harassment online and offline. So this action coalition is really important in that context. And the vision of the action coalition on feminist leadership and movements is that, and I quote here, by 2026, feminist leaders and feminist led organizations and movements, including, including those led by trans, intersex, and non-binary people, indigenous women, women and people with disabilities, young feminists, and other historically excluded people are fully resourced and supported to become sustainable, can carry out their work without fear of reprisal, and advance gender equality, peace, and human rights for all. So we hope that today's session will add to building momentum and energy around that vision. Before moving into the panel discussion with these wonderful leaders of the Action Coalition on the contents of the draft blueprint, which is where we'll start, we will then have uh, a panel. We'll have about 25 minutes also for uh, Q&A from the audience. So please do listen deeply to the speakers and start thinking about your questions for them. Following that, our panelists will outline for you how to make commitments, because this is really important, this moment of making commitments um, and putting action to these beautiful words around the vision. Um, so we'll end around the commitments section, we'll also have time for questions and answers. Um, and because, of course, that's really important because whoever you are, wherever you are, you can make a commit meaningful commitment to this agenda. I'm going to leave it here and hand over to Hannah Christian Dorty, who will share with us um, the visual story of the Action Coalition, how we got here. So over to you, Hannah. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Hakima, and good afternoon, good morning, good day to all of you, wherever you are, are in the world. My name is Hanna Birna Kristjánsdóttir. I'm a co-lead of the Action Coalition from UN Women, uh, along with my colleague, Sarah Hendricks, and I am 
deeply honored and privileged to be here with you today. I would like to, on behalf of all of us, to thank the leaders of this action coalition that have done so much to make sure that they reach an agreement, that, it, that they come to a conclusion. I know it's been quite a journey for all of you, but let me just say how, how privileged we feel to be small part of it and what an amazing job you have all been doing. So thank you so much. I wanted to ask if we could see the slide. We have made this slide for you, which we call the Action Coalition Journey. We wanted to begin by telling you how, where, where we come from and where we landed in, how we landed in Mexico, if you like, and then we will explain what we are aiming to happen between Mexico, that is between now and until Paris this summer. So if we just refresh our memory, and I, don't, I know that I don't have to do this to this group, but still let's just remember the simple and fairly sad fact that we are here because 26 years after the Beijing Platform of Action, not a single country, not a single country in the world has achieved gender equality. And there is this pressing need to go from words, statements, and all kinds of sort of promises to the future to actually go into actions funded and game-changing actions. And this is why the actions co action coalitions were are part of our journey with the Jeff, and this is why we find them to be utmost important. Uh, they could be something like our DED, Anita that is with us today, has sometimes called them the business plan for the future that will make sure that women and girls around the world get the future they need. So if we start from this journey, and we of course will are sharing all of the slides that you see here today in the exhibition hall, you can see that it is over a year ago where we started the generation equality journey, if you like, where France, UN Women and Mexico decided to co-host a forum. We did this, of course, centered around civil society and youth that has been sort of the fuel behind all of this. And we aim to move into um, a game-changing plan that we could use for five years to make sure that we could, would get the real results. And you can see the journey on this slide, but I just want to make sure that we all recognize what I know that our great leaders here today know that the action coalitions are global, they are multi-stakeholder and they are an innovative platform where we are trying to do things differently. We're trying to do things in partnership. We're trying to remember what unites us, but not what divides us. And this is why this has been such a great collaboration. And for all of us that are feminists around the world to see leaders from such a different uh, sort of uh, walks of life. We see youth activists sitting down, with, sitting down with ministers from around the world, with private sector, with international organizations, and deciding and making consensus around how they would like to see the world for women and girls. And after a long journey, dear friend, we did uh, finally decide we are co-creation and loads of loads of discussion, but a consensus was built around six themes. So we have six action coalitions that we have now been working on ever since with our leaders in, within each of the action coalitions. We today, and I'm proud to tell you that we have 95 leaders. They were selected from over 2000 letters of intent and they were selected 95 leaders with a balance and diversity that represents generation equality. They have been working throughout the for the past uh, 12 months or so to make sure that they reach consensus around their blueprints that includes in each of the action coalition four game changing actions. And this is what we are hoping will not only change the world, but also change the future for everyone involved. And this is why we are now proudly today in Mexico, kicking off this great initiative with all of our leaders we are presenting our blueprints, we are presenting our acceleration plan for gender equality, and this is, can all be seen in the exhibition hall, and we are having these conversation as this one today, but also networking sessions along with Mexico to make sure that you all know what is happening within the action coalitions. And finally, I would just like to thank all of the ones that have been working on this with us, particularly Mexico, of course, and France, but also a special thanks go to the civil society and youth for constantly pushing us to do things 
better differently and in a co-creational way. Uh, and then I will come in later to make sure that I will also tell you about how we see the commitment making going uh, in the same direction, but over and out. Hakim, and thank you so much for giving me the space to introduce the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah for that exhaustive overview of the journey of the Action Coalitions. It's my pleasure now to introduce Anita Batia, Deputy Executive Director of UN Women, to give us an overview of the Action Coalition program of work. Over to you, Anita. Thank you very much, uh, Hakima. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm so delighted on behalf of UN Women to be with you here today and to just say a few words uh, to kick off the discussion. Um, I am really pleased that we are kicking off this morning with a topic which is very dear to my heart and of fundamental importance in the post-pandemic world. As Hannah laid out so eloquently, this has been quite a journey and in fact, Today, while being the culmination of many, many months, perhaps even more than a year of work to get us to this point, is also the start of a new step in the process because it is, as Hannah explained, the inflection point at which we harvest all of the contributions that all of you have made and think forward to bold transformative commitments that can emerge out of this shared collective body of work. I want to say just a few things uh, about why this topic is so very important today. First, because we have seen that the pandemic has actually set us back quite a bit and that although last year was supposedly the year of celebration of 25 years of progress since Beijing, it actually became the year of understanding how little had actually been achieved in 25 years, how much more needs to be done and how profound an impact a one-time event like the pandemic is having in terms of moving us backwards, which requires us to really think about bold action in various ways. The pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, has affected women's income, it has affected women's health, it has affected women's security in ways that were unforeseen. It has affected income badly because so many of the sectors that were hit by the pandemic are heavily feminized sectors, sectors such as retail, tourism, domestic work. It has hit health because access to life-saving reproductive health services and contraceptive services fell during the pandemic because governments appropriately pivoted to solving the public health crisis. And it has sadly affected women's security because we saw an exponential rise in violence against women. These impacts are profound and they must be addressed. And the fact is that women's voices, women's leadership, feminist leadership has been crucial to make the world aware, not just of the impact of the crisis, but of the structural issues, underlying systems that led to the crisis in the first place. Had we implemented the SDGs, we would perhaps not be in the position that we are today but it is our collective failure to have advanced fast enough on the SDGs and fast enough on structural changes that have put us in the position we are today. So given that we are at a crisis point and at an inflection point, how are we going to use this opportunity to really move forward in a bold and transformational way? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the opportunity at hand. Feminist leadership has been fundamental, whether it is in Belarus or in Beirut, in Sudan or in Myanmar. The face of 
holding up democracy today is that of a woman. I am struck every time I look at the news by how much the face of courage and leadership today is that of a woman. The face of the pandemic has been that of a woman. The face of our way out of the pandemic will be that of a woman. The Bertolt Brecht play, Mother Courage and Her Children, comes to my mind all the time when I am looking at pictures of what is happening in the world today. Mother Courage fought against war. Women today are fighting against the structural inequities that are holding us back. I am so proud of the work that has been done in this coalition to bring to the fore key issues. And now a few words on what those issues are. The Action Coalition has formulated a roadmap that includes bold, practical, and exciting actions, which will galvanize around uh, key themes and ensure that feminist organizations and movements are fully resourced and supported. As you may know, UN Women has a huge network of women's organizations that we work with. And one thing that has become crystal clear in the pandemic is that these organizations have been decimated in many parts of the world. So I'm so glad to see that part of the conversation today is going to be with partners who are in the position to make substantial decisions on how to keep feminist movements alive. Ladies and gentlemen, the financial frailty of the feminist leadership movements cannot be overestimated, cannot be underestimated because this is something that we actually need to pay attention to. It is not enough to say that we need to ensure feminist leadership movements are kept alive. It is important to walk the talk and actually fund them to make sure that they have a chance to survive when there are so many threats to their very existence, whether it is from anti-democratic forces and popularly elected dictators, or it is from the fact that funding is going to other things today. Whatever the reasons, we must work collectively to preserve feminist leadership and ensure that it is able to play its rightful place in helping us all to build back equal. Let me end again by echoing Hannah's thanks to all of you for your hard work and just to say that I trust you will have a very stimulating discussion and I look forward to hearing that. Thank you so much. Uh, for those in wild hit movements and leadership. I had to pass in power. Um, I had to achieve in five years from now. Over to you, Cynthia. Uh, hello, could I turn on my video, please? It's somebody help Cynthia turn. Cynthia, you, you start to speak and uh, it will turn on. You, you just uh, okay. start to speak. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I am pleased to join you today for this important discussion. The Interparliamentary Union is very privileged uh, to be co-leading 
uh, generation equality action coalition on feminist movements and leadership together with the U, C, L, D, and many others. So our action coalitions visions combine two uh, main aspects. First of all, promoting inclusive, strong, and well-resourced feminist, woman-led, and girl-led movements, and achieving a gender parity and feminist leadership, which is one that ensures the full and equal participation of women and girls in decision-making, and is able to drive gender responsive laws and policies and budgets. These two aspects are strongly connected. Not only do women and feminist movements provide a much needed a push for a, a feminist agenda, but they also provide a pool of new young women leaders. So the IPU data shows that throughout the world, only 1% out of four MPs are women, and only 1% of MPs are young women under 30. So we know today that gender parity is possible where there is political will. So in 2020, parliaments with legislated quotas elected nearly 12% more women than parliament par that parliamentans without. But electoral quotas is just one step. We need gender sensitive institutions and enabling environment. So this means having a critical look at institutions that had been male dominated for too long. At the IPU, we have developed a plan of action for gender sensitive parliament, which provides a roadmap to making institutions gender responsive. This includes gender parity in leadership positions, but also having a clear mandate dedicated mechanisms and the necessary resources to integrate a feminist lens in, in all aspects uh, of, of their work. So women's um, parliamentary caucuses, gender committees, and other such bodies must work hand in hand with civil society organizations to advance feminist policies. This is particularly important today if we want to build back better. Finally, we need to make the political environment more favorable to women's participation, including online. IPU research shows that 85% of women MPs have been subjected to intimidation, harassment, or violence of some sort. Online violence against women is particularly dissuasive for young women to get involved in public life. If generation equality is to succeed, we need to tackle this as an utmost priority. To conclude, I want to highlight that local leadership positions are often the first entry point of young women aspiring to enter political office, as it was my case at 21 years old, my first, the first election I, I run in. So we need to work within our political parties and promote policies that integrate the voices of women and girls in all aspects of decision-making, including quotas at the local and the national level, and we need male allies as well. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to share this forum with you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Cynthia, for emphasizing the need for local leadership positions of young women and feminists, and also the risks that they face um, and the violence on and offline. So thank you so much for that. Now that we've kind of set the context in, of, in which this action coalition is being developed, I'd like to go into a bit more detail about what is in the action coalition. What are these, um, what are these, this blueprint that we're developing and what are these actions that we're trying to put forward? So for this, I'd like to turn to our esteemed colleague from the government of Malawi, um, Her Excellency, Dr. Patricia Kaliati, um, to talk to us a little bit about the principles of the Action Coalition. What have we identified there for the realization of our vision? Uh, 
Uh, thanks so much. Um, I'm on the road, but I would like to thank you very much for inviting me to take the floor. Your Excellences, Kunzile um, Nguka, the Executive Director of uh, UN Women, Hakim Abbas, uh, the moderator, we salute you very much, Mamu. Uh, Cynthia Lapoz, uh, the board member of uh, IPU, the representatives of the Netherlands, Veronica Bingo, uh, the OHCR, uh, OHCHR, uh, the Shamiso, uh, the Gender Links, uh, the young feminist uh, from Europe and the ladies and the gentlemen and all my seniors present this evening. Let me thank all of our, our, our uh, first of all, congratulate UN Women in Partnership with the government of uh, France as well as Mexico, uh, with the leadership and also uh, partnership of civil society and youth organization uh, for successfully organizing this generational equality forum in Mexico City. Uh, once again, let me express my profound gratitude to join you in this generation equality forum, which has been convened in Mexico as uh, we uh, await the other leg to be held in Paris from 30th June uh, to 2nd July 2021. Your Excellencies and all my seniors, my task today is to highlight the key concepts and also principles, including uh, intersectionally, uh, intersectional narratives or inclusivity and also participation and accountability as they relate to gener uh, generational equality fora. Let me let, uh, last time it was on 8th March, 18th March, and also on the uh, 23rd March. On 18th March, I met with uh, uh, governments of Canada and also the Netherlands, where we discussed how best we could promote the action coalition six on uh, feminist uh, movements and also leadership. On 23rd March, we met again within the framework of uh, uh, various uh, uh, the frame the framework of uh, excuse me action coalition six and later on the same day we discussed issues concerning adolescents, girls and young women. As the Minister responsible for Gender, uh, Community Development, the Social Welfare, I do not take this for granted, but appreciate the commitment the FOLA has on issues related to gender equality. In fact, this is what we are looking forward to see, that if we've been challenged for a number of years, as your ministers and your, as, your, as your parents and sisters, we are looking forward to be guided by the uh, generational equality and see what is it that we are looking forward for the nation to be like. What is it that we are looking for for the member states to do for you? What is it that we are looking for for the United Nations to do, uh, the UN to do for you? What is it that we are looking for for the, uh, the, the 17 sustainable development goals being implemented in the way which we are looking for as women? This is so paramount and we thank you very much. All those programs, uh, all those programs which are in the affirmative, uh, feminist movements. Feminist movement and leadership is based on the concept of uh, a global innovative magistral uh, stakeholder uh, partnership uh, that will catalyze collective uh, action, spark global and also local con the conversation among generations, drive increased uh, public and private investment, and drive concrete transformative results for women and girls in their diversity. For us to achieve this vision, which has been capitalized here, we have agreed as action coalition members on feminist movements and also leadership to abide by the following principles. One, we recognize that women and girls are not a homogeneous group and that the vying circumstances and conditions mean that diverse women and girls are located along axis of power in the various ways. We thus apply the principles of intersectionality and also inclusion. Two, as feminists, we are committed to a transformative, transformative agenda 
uh, for gender equality, which goes beyond the gender binary and includes those who have uh, historically been excluded from feminist organizations, such as uh, trans and in, intersexual, uh, intersexual people. And the uh, non-binary people, we recognize that feminist leadership is about what you do with power and not about who holds power. We recognize the invariable contribution being made by young feminists and the young feminist led and also girls led movements around the world and they prioritize the inclusion of young feminists and girls. Your Excellencies and all my seniors, it is our dream and vision uh, that by 2026, organizations and institutions in all sector practices are accountability for their com commitments to gender equality and human rights, provide and increase support for feminist movements and organizations that see financial, legal, as well as policy, and the practice feminist principles in leadership, shifting and also sharing power with historically excluded groups and also people, and promoting gender parity in all decision-making spaces. Let us use this global gathering and celebrate the power of women's rights and activism feminist solidarity and also youth leadership to accelerate the implementation of ambitious global commitments for gender equality in the UN decade of action as the world builds back better from, uh, for, uh, from COVID-19. We thank you very much my seniors and all my sisters and all government and member states for supporting the feminist movement. And we are ready to support the feminist and we are still doing it and all those uh, programs which we are looking forward to do, we are very ready to do that as we support you. May God remember you in a special way. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for reminding us about those really powerful principles in that action coalition. Um, we thank you so much for that intervention. I'm gonna get to go to our next four panelists to speak to the four action areas of the blueprint, because the blueprint actually goes into more specificity about what the actions can be and what we hope to achieve in the next five years and indeed how we'll achieve that. So the first person I'd like to go to is the Vice Minister and Director General for International Cooperation of the Government of the Netherlands, Kitty van der Hedden. May I go to you? Thank you. Hakima, uh, great to see you all wherever you are. Um, I think my video should be starting now, it does. And it's wonderful to really be here at the Generation Quality Forum. And thank you all for organizing this because this is absolutely crucial for the future we want. Now, I think all of us here are here, whether we're government, business, NGO, activists, CSOs, because we all believe faster progress towards gender equality is urgent, it is needed, and we need to take action now. And the COVID pandemic, which I call the, the, the crisis with a woman's face, only made that more urgent. So could we use the recovery of COVID uh, as a chance to finally chart that pathway towards a more equal future for men and for women? Um, isn't women's equal participation the game changer we need to achieve those SDGs? And how do we actually get there? And so this session to me really is about how do we make that happen together? And how do we commit to action? That's the outcome we need. Now, let's be honest, I'm an economist by background. To get it done, we do need to take ABBA as our guiding light. Remember, I mean, this may be a generational thing. Years ago, when I grew up, it was ABBA who sang money, money, money. Well, we do need to talk about money, guys. And that's what Action One really is about. Action One of this Action Coalition on feminist movement and leadership um, is the following. By 2026, we need to double the global annual growth rate of funding from all sectors committed to feminist and women's led organizations, fund groups, activists and movements in all their diversity. Now, how do we do that? Well, three things that we need. One, 
We need to increase direct, core, flexible, multi-year, sustainable funding, as Anita said, sustainable funding, by raising awareness how feminist and women-led organizations are key driver of transformational change. It just won't happen without us. Two, by ensuring more equitable distribution of funding at different levels between organizations in the North and those in the South. And third, by investing more in tracking, monitoring, and reporting on all types of funding for gender equality and feminist and women-led organization. Now, money might be very important, but increased and better quality funding isn't a goal in itself, right? It's a means to an end. We need more. What do we need? We also need political leadership. And the previous speakers already mentioned, um, you know, the, the fairly abysmal state we're in as a world community. Um, I think we urgently need to support feminist movement and women's led organizations to ensure that women and girls take their seat and claim their right. I mean, come on, only four countries in this world have a parliament that comprises of 50% women? Four countries in the world. We're talking 2021. Uh, worldwide, 25% of parliamentarians are women. Women serve as heads of state in only 22 countries today. Well, we're 1994 countries. And 119 countries in this world have never had a female leader. And I am afraid my country is unfortunately among them. So if we continue at the current rate, gender equality in the highest positions of power will not be achieved for another 130 years. Now that means I won't see it before I push up the daisies, but unfortunately my daughter will not see it before she uh, uh, leaves this world. Your daughter won't see it. The daughter of my daughter won't see it. My great great grandchild won't see it. I think it's simply infuriating. 26 years after Beijing. So the lack of women's participation in society threatens to delay, obviously, the achievement of the SDGs, which promised women and girls full gender equality and all legal, social, and economic barriers to their empowerment removed. So we need to put our money where our mouth is. We need investments into gender equality and women's empowerment to be at par, and currently they're lagging behind the investments compared to most other girls. I mean, I find it till, you know, hard to accept that the share of ODA that contributes to gender equality, principally or significantly, is only 45% of bilateral aid, about a third for multilateral organizations, and 23% for private philanthropy, according to the DAC OECD. I mean, that's quite far from, at least in the EU, what the Gender Action Plan has uh, agreed to, which is 85%. So we're really, really lagging behind. Money does matter. I'm an economist. Money talks. Let's walk that talk. Um, Achieving those commitments obviously is a very long-term endeavor. And for me, it's very important that we have support for locally generated change led by women and girls of the South. It's up to the women and girls there to do it. It's up to us as donors to support them, to enable them. Four reasons why partnerships with women rights organizations and action coalitions such as these are so important. I'm almost done. Uh, one, women's right activism are clearly a key driver of legal and policy change. Nobody else will do it if women don't. Secondly, sustained progress towards gender equality will only be achieved if we start to question those entrenched norms and practices. And that requires a change in society that can only happen in society themselves. So Southern organizations will be key. Third, women's organizations are almost always the pioneers to design effective ways of advancing gender equality and fourth, let's not forget that we have achieved tremendous progress and that as a result of that, we're also seeing tremendous backlash. Women's right groups, feminist movements are a crucial antidote to the regressive forces that are pushing back gender equality gains and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, last statistics that I'll throw out there. Only 0.5% of total International aid for gender equality initiatives goes to Southern feminist organizations. Just imagine what that means. To me, 0.5% of international aid to gender equality initiatives going to Southern organizations, it's almost like adolescent sex. Everybody says they're doing it, no one really is. We're not putting our money where our mouth is. 
Um, so for me, it is an absolutely important that we start to walk the talk. We put our money where our mouth is. We raise resources for gender. We fund the feminists and we select Southern partners. How have we done this as the Netherlands? By realizing as part of this action coalition, more political and financial support for women's rights organization. We committed between 2021 and 2025, 80 million euros for leading from the South in support of Southern feminist organizations and 75 million to power of women to fund the work and the results of women's rights organizations. I hope that as part of the commitments we see, many others that are part of this uh, action coalition that are interested in really making transformational change happen, follow suit because we are very late. We're 26 years behind. It's time to get going. Back to you, Akima. Thank you so much, Kitty. Thank you for being so clear about the need and the urgency for funding feminist movements in the Global South, but also for better resourcing to feminist movements in the Global South. And thank you so much for bringing ABBA into the conversation. What would we do without ABBA? <laughs> um, I'd now like to bring it to Veronica Bielga of the Office of the United Nations High Commission of Human Rights. Veronica is going to speak to us about action two of the blueprint of this action coalition. Over to you, Veronica. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Akima. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Veronica Birga, and I work with OHCHR, the UN Human Rights Office. And OHCHR feels really privileged and proud to be one of the global leaders of this action coalition. And I'm very happy to be here today to present the current thinking on action two of the blueprint. So this action is about promoting, expanding and protecting civic space across all domains, including online, and supporting the efforts of women and feminist human rights defenders and women peace builders, including those who are trans, intersex, non-binary, to defend civic space and eliminate barriers to feminist action, organizing and mobilization in all its diversity. So this action is really about promoting, protecting and expanding civic space for feminist action, organizing and mobilization. But what do we mean by civic space? Civic space is the legal and policy space within which people express views, assemble, associate, and engage in dialogue with one another and with authorities with regard to issues that affect their lives, from you know, the quality of basic services to respect for fundamental human rights and freedoms. Today, unfortunately, uh, we are witnessing uh, uh, a closing or shrinking of civic space around the globe through laws, policies, uh, and practices that constrain the exercise of fundamental freedoms, such as the freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, and association. Peaceful protests are being cracked down on. Activists are often confronted individually and collectively with threats, attacks, surveillance, doxing, excessive use of force, arbitrary arrest and detention, and forced disappearances and killings. Defamation, lawsuits, and other forms of judicial harassment are also often misused to criminalize, monitor, and otherwise threaten defenders. And with COVID-19 and the introduction of emergency powers and broad restrictions, the safety and work of human rights defenders and social movements is at even greater risk. Now, although the closing of civic space affect all defenders and social movements, feminist movements and women human rights defenders face additional and specific obstacles and violations, which are shaped by who they are, for example, women, girls, non-binary people, who they identify with or are part of the feminist movement, for example, or what they are working on, for example, the human rights of LGBTIQ plus people or sexual and reproductive rights. According to the latest reports by frontline defenders and civicists, women's rights and LGBTIQ plus rights are among the most targeted sectors of human rights defense. 
Now, the risks and challenges faced by feminist defenders and women human rights defenders are also obviously intersectional. For some, because of other aspects of their identities, such as age, religion, ethnicity, class, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, etc., the obstacles and risks manifest in distinct ways. Now, to transform this situation, we are proposing three main tactics. The first is to advance protection measures, policies, and enforceable legislation to protect the human rights and security of feminist activists, organizations, and movements. Now, this tactic encompasses ensuring that domestic laws and administrative practices protect defenders from discrimination, marginalization, hate crimes, and ensure the privacy of personal data, define clear limit for surveillance, avoid overly broad definition of who is a terrorist, for example, or of what represents a threat to public order or to so-called so -called morality or security, et cetera. <clears throat> this tactic also encompasses ensuring adequate protection policies for feminist defenders. And good protection practices should be designed with the involvement of defenders themselves. They should recognize their diversity, ensure inter intersectional approaches in the assessment of risks and design of interventions, and they should focus on holistic security, meaning physical safety, but also digital and economic security and psychosocial well-being, among other things. This tactic also encompasses building capacity of feminist defenders to conduct risk assessments and take mitigation measures, develop individual and collective security plans and protocols, adopt tactics that lower the risks of retaliation, and engage in practices for self and collective care and well being. Now, the second tactic is about tracking and documenting violations against feminist activists, organizations, and movements. The risks, the threats, and attacks faced by feminist activists, including their gender specificities, should be monitored and trends analyzed so that adequate policy responses can be de designed and implemented, whether it is online or offline. This is also the first step uh, to ensure accountability of perpetrators. The third tactic, finally, is about deepening solidarity within the feminist movement and across social justice movements and eliminating harmful stereotypes that reinforce discrimination, entrench inequality and stigmatize feminist activists, organizations and movements. The general backlash against human rights should bring movements in favor of diversity, equality, and rights to work more closely together in resistance. We cannot afford fragmentation. We must stand in solidarity with one another, and we must stand together against bigotry and hatefulness in all its manifestations. Narratives about feminist defenders challenging culture, tradition, or the family contribute to a widespread sense of suspicion or even hostility towards them. And therefore, it is very important to dismantle these narratives and show the immense contributions that femini feminist defenders have made and continue to make to societies at large. I will stop here for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Veronica, for really giving us that overview of of that action, but also of how feminist movements and leadership face the, these threats in these moments and what we can do about them. Um, I'd like to now hand over to Shamiso Shigorimbo of Gender Net Links, who is in Malawi to tell us about the third action area in the blueprint. Please, Shamiso. Okay, um, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, and um, thank you, Hakima, for that introduction. Um, it's really a privilege to um, sit with the rest of the action um, leaders. Um, it's been really a great opportunity to just pass ideas and learning and really just um, work towards um, um, feminist movement and leadership. So I will speak to action number three, which basically is um, 
working towards advocating or advancing gender parity in decision making and leadership. Um, so Action three speaks to advancing and increasing meaningful participation and leadership and decision making power of women, girls and non binary people in all their diversity. Um, the goal of this action, what this action intends to implement is by 2026 to increase meaningful participation, leadership and decision making power of girls and leaders, including those who are trans, intersex, non binary, and they're obviously um, efforts through which this can be done, which we've been able to kind of list into two. Um, and I'll speak to, um, firstly, when it comes to advancing gender parity, it's important to include women in their diversity or, or all our um, women in their diversity are able to access um, all aspects of public life and economic decision making because those play a central role, as well as including private sector, civil society, international and um, political organizations, as well as government institutions, including the executive and legislative positions. Um, in this, we intend to promote and expand feminist gender transformative and inclusive laws and policies. Um, so in the action, you know, there are obviously a lot of benchmarks that we have to take into consideration. And these include um, elements of laws and policies. These include elements of data and accountability, as well as education, norms and financing. So I'll speak to each of those and kind of just try and give um, just some examples from where we sit. And um, Hakima, I'm in South Africa. Um, Genderlinks is a regional organization and we are in 15 sided countries. So our work is within all those um, sectors. So just also to speak from what our commitment as we come in as a, as a South-based civil society organization, where we, we come into after just explaining just the different elements. So when it comes to laws and- so. Um, okay. So before you go, go on, we're having some trouble with your sound. Is there oh. perhaps if you take off the headphones? I wonder if that would be better, but I'm not sure. There's a bit of trouble with the sound, so it's hard to hear you. Could we try now? Could you speak now, Shamisa, to, to, so that I can be sure to, to be hearing you, whether I'm hearing you well? Okay. Unfortunately, we're not hearing you at all now. So perhaps with the headphones, <laughs> um, and hopefully our back end will be able to fix something. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you very okay. well. Okay, thank you. Thank Sorry you about that technology. Yeah, technology can let you down at times. Okay, so I'll speak to just in terms of, um, you know, what this means in terms of laws and policies. Um, so what obviously from all sectors, we need to develop and implement policies and regulations to advance gender parity and ensure participation of women, girls, and non-binary people in all their diversity in decision-making. So one thing that I know, especially from where we sit, we speak about not just um, policies and, and laws changing, but in terms of participation, that is active participation or effective participation of women and girls um, in terms of decision-making and bringing about change. So we're not just say, you know, so it's not about the numbers only. So we could talk about numbers, but actually effective participation is key to remember. Um, when it comes to data and accountability, we speak to conducting, to conduct and communicate intersectional feminist analysis, which includes analysis of data in preparation, implementation, monitoring of policies, budgets and laws. And this is really, really key. So, I mean, the one thing that we also speak to, especially um, on the ground is just basically in terms of just um, de disaggregated data, it's one thing to speak of disaggregated data, but what are the different layers of it? So usually people talk about sex disaggregation, but then people don't go on to speak of um, disability or just other forms of being an other. Um, so those are also key elements that we need to take into account. Um, what we also spoke of and we're discussing and deliberating is when it comes to education, you know, to just build on cross-sectoral and um, alliances and support mentoring, which includes experience and capacity sharing for feminists or with feminists 
with feminist activists um, and organizations, movements, and leaders, we should bring about encouragement and support of intersectional and multi-generational dialogue. Um, so one of the things that also kind of keeps coming up is, you know, when people talk about this, um, you know, reformative um, spaces, are they actually board members who are young, female feminists, you know, so really, you know, putting that out there and really challenging the different spaces to say, okay, who sits on those boards? Who sits on the boards of those organizations? Are they young feminists who are part of those boards and who are part of the decision makers? Um, as I continue, I'll speak to the norms and finances. So in terms of the norms, we speak of addressing um, harmful stereotypes and gender norms um, in order to ensure decision-making power and leadership for feminist activists and organizations and movements. And when it comes to financing, we speak to investing in um, gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting mechanisms in all levels of government, private sector, international organizations, civil society organizations, and all aspects of the economy. So I think the key is it's really, really important to speak of just, you know, um, what we normally use is a framework by Tenjo Tinso, which is a conceptual framework in terms of just, you know, increasing women's participation in all spheres of, um, you know, of decision making um, areas of life, so to speak. So we speak to access, participation, transformation. So we, so in terms of aligning it with AC um, six and what we're trying to do in action three, we're really speaking to access, participation, and transformation, um, and just really achieve, and you know, coming to a place where we can all make commitments and really achieve um, gender parity. But I'd also like to give just a few numbers, and I know my numbers will speak mostly to just. Um, women's representation, political representation. So one thing to keep in mind, which is also from the IPU um, website and research is just that in terms of young female um, MPs that are under 30, globally, the ratio stands at 60 to 40 men and women. So they have, you know, women sit at 60%. And then of that, um, of that um, ratio, 2.2% um, are under 30. So of course, you know, the youth involvement continues to be a big element and also just in terms of the gender parity and um, effective involvement of women is also a key issue. And then in terms of just um, commitments to consider, so um, in the blueprint, you will, of course, the documents will be shared as we make, you know, as we prepare for Paris, but um, just some of the potential commitments that we kind of, you know, put out there, are, you know, for one, um, is organizations in all sectors commit to collect intersectional age and gender sensitive poverty data that includes data on women and groups who have historically been excluded. And that falls under the data and accountability, which I think is really, really key if we're really you know, wanting to make a benchmark and move forward. Hakima, I kind of lost track of time. So I'm not sure how many more minutes I have when I wanted to continue. Unfortunately, we, we are at the end, Shamiso, but um, okay. do, do you want to wrap up your last point? Okay, so let me just wrap up my last point quickly. So I think in terms of just wrapping up the last point, I think the thing that, um, we need to walk away with is we want to measure change beyond numbers, right? And we want to keep in mind that there are three clusters, laws, policies, and services. And, um, you know, just things to remember is, is things like, you know, we need institutional participation and to ask the how and the what. And what does transformation mean? How do we get women's agency out there? And how do we get to change minds and attitudes, which in, in effect will change laws and services? So, yeah, thank you very much. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Shamiso. And so sorry to mislocate you. Um, Shamiso from Gender Links in South Africa, working on Southern Africa. Um, and thank you, Shamiso, for bringing the idea of access, participation, and transformation to the conversation, and for bringing in young feminists, which is an important segue to our next speaker, who will speak to action area four, who is Ksenia Kellner of the Young Feminist Europe. Welcome, Ksenia. Thank you, Akima. And hello, everyone. I'm very um, happy to be able to speak to you today. Um, I'm Ksenia Kellner. I'm a co-founder of Young Feminist Europe. And Young Feminist Europe is a young feminist-led organization. And we are a part of the yeah, of this action coalition and try to bring in young feminist voices and um, leadership as well. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about the uh, different actions that we have, uh, well, action item four that we have um, that focuses on young feminist and adolescent girl 
um, let um, organizing, putting them in leadership and the different tactics we have for that. But uh, also to say, I think um, young feminists bring really um, transformative power into these spaces. So if we want to achieve the vision and um, of the 2030, the goals of the 2030 agenda, the Beijing platform for action, and um, really wanting to change systemic inequalities, uh, we need to move beyond this just bringing young people, young feminists, different diverse groups in and just increasing diversity. And we really need to move towards transformation, which means we're not just there to be um, participating in something that's already there, but we really ask to do things differently. So sometimes it's <laughs> um, it's really also about yeah asking people to. I think that's what we've what we've been asking a bit more is um, yeah leaning into this uncom feeling of being uncomfortable with doing things differently, um, making spaces more horizontal, more participatory. And um, I think the challenges that I'll be speaking about for young people is not just um, that we address them through the Action Coalition, but also within the Action Coalition, because um, some of you might be aware that the Action Coalition youth leaders, um, the, young, yeah, the youth task force, as well as um, the national gender youth activists and some other uh, young feminists have been developing the Young Feminist Manifesto for the Jeff and have some really concrete recommendations for the action coalitions as well, which includes also changing some of the processes. Um, and so today what we are presenting, um, it's important for me to say what we're presenting is already something really strong and really good. But still, um, we need to, um, after Mexico even, that's when we engage with everyone else, um, take a look at what is still missing and how can we improve um, the process, which includes applying an intersectional approach, which includes more transformative design that, um, yeah, is also directed into individual transformation and relational transformation. And um, yeah, creating more transformative and bold spaces also from now till, till Paris. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking to you now, and um, I would, would love to engage with you directly. Um, of course, due to this format, it's currently not um, possible. It's, it's virtually, um, so of course there are challenges. But I think really creating more spaces for multi-stakeholder co-creation, that's something that we are still figuring out and, and improving. But also, um, for the action items, so we have different tactics to um, improve the um, young feminist leadership um, and, and adolescent girl leadership. And one core thing is really um, direct funding and different type of funding. Young feminists organize differently. Um, we are sometimes different activists from across the uh, from across the globe and um, we are sometimes we're not just organized in in registered groups a lot of us are working in, in networks or in groups and in informal groups so that really leads to a difficulty to access funding because it's very complicated um, and we need direct funding because the power power imbalances the issue with tokenism um, is really difficult for us is, and especially if we don't have direct funding um, for youth-led organizations, for young feminist-led and adolescent girl organizations, we need to have direct access to that. So um, one of the first actions and tactics is really to increase direct and different type of funding, um, including, for example, fiscal sponsorship and um, thinking about that and increasing funding overall. So that is really a key thing. Um, but it also includes, besides financing um, specific laws and, and, and policy, policies and really to adapt a more um, and transformative practices, donor practices, but also have, yeah, sorry, law and policies that um, ensure that as young people, we cannot just participate in something, but are really included in decision making and what that means and, um, and to 
yeah, to apply um, practices that that enable um, us to do that, to to directly shape agendas. Um, but um, furthermore, we for that it's also important to collect data and to create accountability frameworks. Um, sometimes when we talk about youth and young people's engagement, um, there is really a lack of accountability and we need to have better and more and more detailed disaggregated data, but also specific data on, on how youth engagement and decision making is, is, is taking place. And the third um, thing to mention is education and, and capacity building slash strengthening. Um, I think the people who are um, have maybe taken a look at the Young Feminist Manifesto. So that is, of course, um, we need a specific action for um, girls' education, um, critical thinking, feminist approaches. But when we talk about capacity strengthening in terms of um, increasing youth leadership, it's also seeing youth as um, not just people or not just the ones who need capacity strengthening and building, but also um, uh, increase or, or see them as, as, as holders of um, expertise and wisdom as, itself and include them more into capacity strengthening and building also for other stakeholders in the space. So um, it all goes to this transformative um, part um, on learning and unlearning. Um, so what do what does what do young feminists bring um, that maybe also the challenges knowledge that we have? Um, yes, as a last point, because uh, sorry, Hakim, I know we need to move on. There will maybe be other options, but um, it was important for me to mention when we talk about now that we are talking about feminist movement and leadership in the beginning. We mentioned how important feminist leadership and young feminists are in the movements, also challenging the um, feminist movement from within. Um, and I think it's important to mention also the Mexican feminist movement, who is incredibly strong. I studied law in Mexico and worked a bit on, on femicide and the cotton field case aftermath and collecting some data. So being aware of the system in, in Mexico and how the feminist movement can really work or how important the feminist movement in a country like Mexico is to really challenge power, challenge injustice is so important. Today, uh, we have a group of young feminist activists from Mexico who are also launching a petition and um, yeah, and use social media, which we often do. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm encouraging you to keep an eye out for that and just see that young feminists are really changing beyond the formal structures. And thank you for your attention. And I hope we can engage in more conversations um, soon. Thanks. Thank you, Ksenia. And thank you for reminding us and locating us. I think because we're all virtual, it's, it's hard to remember that this is indeed the forum that's taking place in Mexico in many ways and for uplifting feminists in Mexico who have been doing the work for generations and continue to do so much important work in Mexico um, on feminist agendas, including those who have joined um, the Mexican uh, Civil Society Advisory Group. And we'll hear a lot more from them tomorrow. So what you've all heard here is the culmination of work uh, among the Action Coalition leaders to establish productive and power sensitive working arrangements, negotiate language, and ensure that this blueprint is ambitious and inclusive. But as Ksenia reminded us, this is still very much a draft blueprint. Um, and this is the first time that it's being presented exly to you as, as, as an audience. So we're eager to hear your voice and your reactions to the blueprint. Um, we intend as the Action Coalition leaders in this group um, to strengthen that blueprint between now and the next generation of policy forum in Paris. So we'd love to gauge your reactions now and launch a poll. I will turn to my technical colleagues to launch that poll for us. The first poll is what action statements that you heard do you feel most energized around?
Colleagues, was that poll launched? Fantastic. And the second question is, what are the most important commitments you would expect to see for achievement of gender equality? Please do join the poll. We want to hear from you. After the poll, we will have some time for questions from the audience before we go into what does making commitments look like and what is the commitment maker model. So if you haven't voted, please do vote now on your screens and we will close the poll. I will be able to see the votes. Could you now close the poll so that I can see the results? Fantastic, thank you for voting. Uh, we have the largest percentage is in terms of which action statements did you feel the most energized around was around the financing feminist and move, women led movements. These, that got a resounding 38% of votes, while the advancing gender parity and decision maker got 30%. Um, what are the most important commitments you would expect to see for gender, for achievement of gender equality? The lead answer on that is substantially increased funding of feminist and women led organizations. So that really matches what we're hearing in both questions in terms of the need for financing of feminist and women-led organizations. So that's a resounding kind of... You can go to some questions that have been raised by all of you while the speakers have been speaking. Thank you so much for listening attentively and for putting your questions forward. We have one question from Gloria Alcocer, who asks, it's essential to have an intersectional perspective in addressing the multiple forms of violence that are experienced from diverse realities as diverse as women. How will the issue of gender-based political violence be addressed. So that's one question from the audience. The other is women in leadership positions do not necessarily lead to feminist transformational leadership and gender equality. What about that patriarchal structures play in perpetuating sexist and gender segregated political and public spaces? So can I ask all of the panelists and speakers to come on video here and to let me know if any of you want to answer these two questions that we have from the audience, which seem very important and particularly directed around the issue of gender-based political violence and how we move from women in politics to feminist uh, leadership. Who would like to respond to one of these questions? Cynthia, while I have you here, could you jump in perhaps on the political violence? Because I know that uh, IPU has done some really important work in this regard. Yeah, first of all, in the past uh, forums in the IPU, we have made some different groups to talk about political violence and not also to explain what is political violence. Uh, it, so we can expose what we have lived uh, in the political violence as our testimony. So most of us, uh, I think like most of the, of the politicians, the older women, uh, we have suffered political violence in any part of our life. Uh, in my case, when I was running for an election, I was like 25 years old, uh, I suffered a political violence. And I think that what IPU is doing in the last assembly 
uh, in in the last assembly was to um, yeah to to talk about that to be a commitment uh, makers to uh, to lead by example beyond talk we need to show uh, through our actions that we are working in this uh, shared vision so uh, for example at the IPU we have institutionalized gender quotas uh, for example in all decision uh, making bodies in 1980s so the board for example of IPU of young parliamentarians for example have a requirement of 50-50 gender representation and each geopolitical group is represented by one man and woman also uh, for example we have um like we have pushed in all uh, with in all the parliamentarians to have an area and a specific area uh, in their parties in the parliament to uh, pro against violence in politics but also to give testimony to give uh, to share uh, uh, the testimony with other people so uh, in the IPU that's uh, the um, the actions and the IPU also uh, regularly tracks the percentage of women for example um, that are uh, immersed in political violence so this allows us to gauge our progress and understand how uh, can we improve uh, uh, with some measures um, in our targets thank you Thank you so much. Um, and maybe to you, Veronica, um, you also mentioned gender-based political violence and closing civic space and how that can be addressed. Would you have any pointed remarks, just brief remarks on, on this question? Sure, I think uh, absolutely. It is very important, as I mentioned before, to have an uh, enabling environment for uh, feminist uh, action and leadership, and so for participation of uh, feminist activists in public life. And that uh, requires um, adequate legislation, as we said before, and ensuring that legislation is not abused to threaten um, uh, activists and even to commit violence against activists. Um, there is also a need to address the harmful narratives and stereotypes that often, uh, you know, create a hostile environment against activists, especially those working on certain issues. And that is also something that we have tried to highlight in the blueprint. Um, and maybe, and then also, of course, we've talked about protection when uh, activists are facing uh, threats, and that uh, you know has many different elements, uh, including an element of building capacity for self-protection and self-care, but also you know supporting the establishment of uh, networks and ensuring greater solidarity. Maybe an element we haven't touched upon a lot is the issue of safety online and, and, and violence uh, online, uh, which is uh, an increasing uh, problem, especially now that with COVID-19, most of our interactions are confined to the digital space. Um, and I think um, there is uh, quite a wealth of experience out there on how to address violence and intimidation and harassment online, how to establish safe online uh, spaces for feminist action, um, and also how to change the culture of uh, tech companies, no? Encl encouraging greater uh, transparency and working with um, software engineers on, on human rights and gender responsiveness, which is something that the office is quite active on. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you so much. And to remind everyone, there is also a session at the Generation Equality Forum around integrated protection that I would really encourage everybody to attend to learn more about that protection piece that you mentioned, Veronica. Um, Kitty Kastanya and Shamiso, we do have the question, which I know as feminists, we get asked a lot, which is more women in, in government or in leadership doesn't necessarily um, equal transformative leadership or even feminist leadership. So how, what does that look like and how do we actually address the patriarchal structures that uphold some of these systems? I know it's a big question and we don't have a lot of time, but if you could just maybe give some brief response to that question. 
Okay, so I think one thing that also kept coming up um, when we were going through the blueprint was the issues of capacity. So I think we're capacity build, you know, capacity building for, for women in those spaces, right? So that they their lives are transformed and they're able to actually challenge the patriarchal structures, right? Because there is a glass ceiling and they absolutely, um, you know, you don't go in there and you're able to actually bring about the change and the reform that you want. So I think the things that definitely did come up was the issue of capacity building and the mentorship because then you align, um, you know, women in those spaces to actual, um, you know, to, to transform their lives in a way that they're able to bring about the effective change. So, which is why, I mean, even when I spoke about like the participation, one thing that we keep speaking about participation is the effective participation. So one can talk about all oh, women's participation in all the spheres. So there could be board members in private sector, but not having effective, you know, not being effective in that space. So, I mean, I think in terms of the blueprint, we definitely put in place, um, you know, just some elements in terms of how we get, you know, get transformation and change. Um, and indeed, absolutely, women could be occupying those spaces and it doesn't necessarily mean policy change or changes to law and that's absolutely true, yeah. Thank you, Shanisa. Does anyone else like to take this question? Yeah, thank you, Akima. I love this question, it's one of my favorites. Um, I think it's, and we discussed it a lot, um, there's really this difference between female leadership and feminist leadership, right? So female leadership, of course, uh, is a very important uh, tool. And I think we need more um, women in leadership positions. We see how it, is, how it does automatically have a transformative effect in a way, but still increasing um, diversity, as I mentioned before, which means just bringing people in in a current system or, or women into political positions or um, does not necessarily mean transforming them. So when we talk about feminist leadership um, in comparison, it also um, means really a different type of leadership. It means um, taking a look at systems of inequalities and that's what the 2030 agenda is, is about and um, is really taking a look at the systems and, and challenging current power structures. It means um, challenging current um, epistemologies. How do we um, how do we uh, how do we produce knowledge? What is and I, maybe to the point of capacity building? I think that's always um, also between what type of capacity are we building? Maybe responding to you, um, do we do we design it in a way where we need to learn about how the system works and saying like empowering women? Or um, would it rather be a, a different type of capacity building and see that maybe we need to also unlearn things, as I mentioned before, and not necessarily like, really differentiate the type of capacity building then. Um, but yeah, feminist leadership, challenging power structures, power inequalities, leading hor more horizontal. Um, I think that's very important. And uh, I think other people also wanted to come in. So I think this is a conversation yeah. we need to continue uh as well and yeah thank you thank you so much Ksenia. can i go to kitty and then cynthia and then we're going to close this round of q a and just go to our commitments because again that's where we turn these words into action um before we go to the next round of q a so don't worry there will be another time for your questions to be answered um kitty over to you uh thanks akima and of course you know talking about money this is the million dollar question right <laughs> So um, let me first underscore very much what Celia said. There is a huge difference between female leadership and feminist leadership. These are not the same. Uh, and they're often seen because you are a woman that therefore you're a feminist by outside. Well, definitely that's not the case. Um, I think what is really needed is sometimes safety in numbers, right? It's very hard to change the world to be transformational if you're one or 3%. You have to get into a certain threshold and we need as women and as feminists to be much more supportive of each other and it isn't always happening and um, there's two things for me that are incredibly important if we talk about uh, sort of um, uh, challenging the norm changing the norms we can't just do that ourselves as women and as feminists so for me incredibly powerful is if men speak out uh, at the senior leadership to challenge those norms, to change the norms, to give up their seats and their power to women. It doesn't always happen easily, but that is where real change 
will happen. Second, I mean, one pathway to change, again, money talks, maybe I'm too much of an economist, uh, but is really looking also at the power of the private sector. If the private sector, re and I can see this at least happening at, at some point uh, and with some companies uh, here in my environment, that really take women leadership and feminist leadership seriously, um, it's much easier to interact with the politicians. And so it comes from a different source, it's unusual suspect, and they're able to unblock things that I as, a, as an NGO leader would not have been able to do, for example. So really looking at the private sector also to come out, to speak out and to become much more drivers of feminist change and policies uh, would really help us uh, move things forward much quicker than we would be able to do ourselves. So I hope that the private sector that's listening in takes up the challenge. Thank you for that, Kitty. Last intervention from Cynthia, and then we will go to the commitments. Uh, well, thank you so much. I would like to give some good news that is, for example, in Mexico now, that is, well, is my country, I, I actual a uh, congresswoman, in, in Mexico uh, Congress. So it's like we have parity, it's the first legislature of parity in Mexico. Uh, we call the 64 legislature and it's the legislature of parity because of 500, we are 241 uh, women. So it's historically that we did it, yes. Well, uh, what we suffer uh, still is that the coordinators still are men, the decision making, uh, leaders are, are male, but well, now we have 241. What I think is that we need more um, women in the leader positions. For example, uh, of all the parties, we don't have a uh, women as a president, as, as the leader of the party. We don't have only just one coordinator of the um, parliamentary groups. Uh, just one is a woman, the other ones are male. And I think also, that what we need to work a lot is, for example, in Congress, uh, most of women all, all the time, they want like in the committees, when, when they are like uh, fighting for the committees, most of the women always like go down, you no, know, and said, no, well, I, 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 I will wait why they're gonna give to me. And male are like, no, I want budget committee, you know? So I think that what we need to improve is like women believing ourselves to be a well prepared so we can ask and raise our hand to have the big committees, for example, in a Congress or in a government. Now in Mexico also, we have two governors that are women. And what would we need? One of, of these governor, uh, governor of Sonora, for example, Claudia Pavlovich, is the leader of all the governors of Mexico. So she is in a, in a very high level position. So what do, do we need, I think, in politics is to empower women and don't go like one step behind and said, oh no, I only have to, to be in women topics. No, we have to be in the main topics, in the budget topics, in the, in the biggest uh, committees where is the power and the decision maker so we can be as the uh, president of a uh, women um, United Nations have said in different forums, women have to be in the leadership positions to be a decision maker. And I think that that's a, that's a big challenge. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Cynthia. So we have another question that came in that I want us to hold until the end because we've all in different ways talked about generations. Kitty talked about how if we go at this pace, how many generations will continue to keep having to fight these same battles? And Ksenia, you were talking about young feminists taking up as this generation, these fights. Um, and the question that I think is very interesting is what role would we see as most useful for feminist elders who are no longer in leadership positions? So we won't go there now, but we will hold it for, the, for later. Right now, we're gonna go to turn our attention to commitments, the actions. And I'd like to just invite uh, Kitty and Veronica and everyone else to come off video. 
to talk about what commitments would you recommend for realizing our vision? Kitty, you mentioned some examples earlier. Could you give us examples of some of the game-changing commitments you're inspired by? Unfortunately, we've lost our colleague from Malawi. Um, I think oh. there are some tech issues. Um, but if she is here, perhaps she could join. Um, but I would invite, yes, Kitty and Veronica and maybe everyone else to turn off their video while you respond to what commitments would you recommend for realizing our vision? Um, look, a lot has been said, Hakima, and one of the key things I would like to uh, bring out in terms of commitment is really delivering what we have said we would deliver. A lot of the things we've said aren't new, uh, we just haven't done it yet. And when it comes to feminist organizations and how we work with them as donors and as partners and as multilateral organizations, really looking at the power, unlocking the power of Southern feminist organizations, I think the leading from the South uh, program that we at the Netherlands have established really to fund feminist organizations in the South would be a great example that requires you know, to be multiplied a hundredfold, to be upscaled, because honestly, we cannot achieve any of our goals if we keep doing what we do. And I can't say it as well as a male colleague has said this, um, Tio Sowa from the former ED from the African Women's Development Fund. I don't know who remembered who said last year, don't talk about women's rights and gender equality and then give the money to men. But unfortunately, that's what we do. So right, so that commitment and then you know, if we do that, let's not forget it's a 0.5% of international aid that currently goes to Southern Feminist Organization. Now, just imagine what would happen if that would uh, increase to 50%. And so inspired by Michelangelo, um, he once famously said, the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but rather in setting our aim too low and achieving the mark. Now, when it comes to gender equality, our ambition simply cannot be high enough. Um, so that's one thing. I think there's an incredible opportunity in the COVID-19 crisis to build back better and really to look at inclusiveness and look at a feminist perspective of policies writ large, domestic and international. And let's not forget that, you know, they've often said never waste a good crisis, that the women's right to vote was born in the First World War because all the men were away and women felt that they could fend for themselves. We don't need men, right? To really look at this as an opportunity and keep fighting for it because it's in the next two years that we either achieve it uh, and make that transformation, the seed uh, of that transformational change. Um, I do think, and that's an incredibly important part of the commitment that this cannot just be done by either feminist organizations and or government. It really requires a multi-stakeholder engagement. I can't remember who said it. it's multi-stakeholder co-creation that really will drive this commitment to material, tangible results for women and girls that need it uh, worldwide. And again, I think, you know, the biggest, the biggest commitment I would ask from everybody is really to deliver what you say you aim to deliver. And when you deliver, think big, think not, not 0.5 to 5%, Think not 0.5 to 50%. Your ambition cannot be high enough and we can all make it happen. So what's keeping us? Back to you. Thank you so much. Indeed, what's keeping us? Uh, Veronica, what would you say in terms of recommending commitments and examples of that that you've seen? Thank you. Um, I agree with what Kitty said. Um, and I think it's important for all of us also to self-reflect you know, on the commitment we can make and the approaches we take. And I was looking at the chat and the questions and there is a lot of emphasis on intersectionality. And I think we all need to commit to intersectionality, not just being a vague concept or something that we uh, commit to without really understanding what it means, but really uh, unpacking it and making it one of the guiding principles of our action and, and, and commitments. And also, I think it's very important that whatever commitment we do make, um, we really strive to engage with grassroots uh, organizations and at the grassroots uh, level. 
Now, when I um, go back to the area that I was talking about before, the area of, of, of civic space and ensuring and enabling environment for feminist uh, organizing and action, I think you know, it, states, for example, could commit to reform and repeal restrictive and punitive laws, um, such as those that I mentioned before, States, international organizations such as the UN, civil society um, can commit to um, strengthen um, protection mechanisms concerning civic space with attention in particular to the demands and experiences of feminist activists and movements. Um, another example, um, you know, organizations from all sectors, such as national human rights institutions, the UN, regional organizations, uh, international civil society organizations, the media can commit to monitor, document, and report on threats and attacks, violence against feminist activists, organizations, and movements. This is very important, not only to inform um, you know, adequate responses, but also, as I said before, for uh, accountability. And then, um, you know, going back to the issue of narratives and, you know, harmful stereotypes, it's important for all actors, from states to the media, to the entertainment in industry, influencers, you know, the education sector, faith actors, international and regional organizations to commit to invest and act to eliminate harmful gender norms and anti-gender, anti-rights narratives, discrimination, stigma, harassment, and violence against diverse uh, feminist activists, organizations, and movements. Um, I could think of many more, but I will stop there. And certainly this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, there's much more that we can add. And we hope to hear also suggestions on other commitments that could be put forward. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much for getting us started there, Veronica. Can I invite Cynthia Shamiso and Ksenia to join us? Um, because I'd love to hear from you. If you could share with the audience what they can do to contribute, what does it mean to be a commitment maker here? Can I turn to you first, Ksenia? Yes. Um, so what does it mean uh, to be a commitment maker? What can you do? I think um, this is really where it becomes, which is the crucial part of the whole action coalitions. I think it's good that we have the blueprint or are developing the blueprints and have action themes. But that's um, the commitment makers come in to really also localize the actions. And that's where the implementation has to take place. That's the key, a key part of accelerating it. So really think about um, in your communities, local governments, grassroots organizations, um, new maybe SMEs, um, when we talk about private sector, and really think about what is it in, in, in your community in, in your organization, what you can, what you can commit to. And something I also want to add, which is, um, I think, very important is when we talk about this transformative design, when we talk about commitment, it's really not just commitment to take an abstract over there and change like this something over there, which is always very abstract, but really think about the commitment for the change within. Can you still hear me? I think my screen stopped. We can still hear you, Ksenia. You were speaking about the change within. Can you so hear me? not just the change externally. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, the, the, the second point, the second point I wanted to make, I don't know what you heard, <laughs> but the second point I wanted to say is, I think when we um, talk about commitment making and, and encouraging people to um, take commitments, that it's not just an action somewhere else, or I want to change some something else, but really directed towards the own structures. That's what we see a lot that we always tend to talk about change somewhere else, but not within our own structures, our own organizations. And that's key for the intersectional approach. So what are maybe racist structures within organizations, within governments that still exist? 
uh, what are oppressive structures, what are what are, and that includes the individuals within the um, uh, within the organizations, institutions, local governments, like all of the commitment makers that come in. What are some things that you can maybe learn, and what can you unlearn? And so maybe some of the commitments are not just action somewhere else, but within yourself and your own organizations. That is something I would say. Thanks. Hakima. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Shamisa, what would you say in terms of how to be a commitment maker around this action coalition? All right. So I think definitely um, one of the big things that really stands out is, is I guess, um, as a previous speaker term, self-reflection, right? So institutionally, because we're also coming in not as just as individuals, but as organizations, but to be able to look at our own individual like institutional policies to see if they are actually feminist policies, right? So the assumption already is that everybody who's sitting in this leadership, um, you know, who's sitting in the AC leadership is actually a feminist, have feminist policies in their organizations, but that might not be true. So that's what keeps coming up when people say maybe to unlearn certain things. And I think maybe I've been speaking from a perspective where my assumption is everyone in this actual AC6 is a, has feminist um, policies in place or come from a feminist analysis perspective or from a feminist conceptual framework. So I think maybe in terms of making commitment, we start with ourselves because how do we begin to invest financially, or how do we even begin to advocate if we're coming from a point of view where we are actually not on the same page as AC leaders, you know, so I think definitely the commitment is towards whether it's investing financially, whether it is advocating, you know, for um, feminist policies and laws, it's for us to interrogate and make sure that we are coming from a perspective um, where actually we are advancing feminist policies, even within our own structures and in the way that we do work in our organizations, because we cannot talk the talk if we do not walk the talk. So I think that's a big, big element that definitely um, we need to keep in, in mind. Thank you so much, Amisa. And we will be putting up a poll in very soon after we've heard from Cynthia, asking people what commitments they feel they can make from within their institutions. So these points about everybody being able to make a commitment is really important. Cynthia, over to you. Uh, Cynthia, unfortunately, we can't. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, as Kitty says, uh, sometimes we have we are in the budget committee and we give the money to men. So I think that we the first uh, commitment is to believe in ourselves and to um, support women not only by words, supported by budget, supported by actions. So I think that to be a commitment maker means to be led by example, first of all, and beyond talk, we need to show a, like through our actions. So as, as I mentioned, the IPU, the institution that I represent, have institutional, for example, gender quotas, a, and also regularly tracks the percentage of women delegates in our assemblies. So this allows us to gauge our progress and understand how we can improve our target. So, uh, in the IPU, everything is 50-50. Every, like every single rule uh, and every single part of the of the IPU is 50-50. And I think that beyond looking at the numbers, we are ensuring that meaningful um, participation is achieving through the IPU's gender mainstreaming strategy. The strategy aims to institutionalize gender equality in the organization. So build capacity for gender equality and develop gender mainstreaming mechanisms. We are showing that ambitious targets are possible when there is political will. So I hope this provides a necessary push and sources of inspiration for other international organizations and for parliaments to adopt similar policies in their institution. And personally, as a Mexican Congresswoman, I think our commitment is to go and try to help women that are back, that are trying to get in a, in a seat, that are trying to get in Congress, that want to be governors or, or political leaders. I think our big commitment is to help other women to be in the um, leadership position so we can be like a generation of, of women 
uh, in power. I think that's the most commitment and these kind of forums participating and being here, I think it's like try to put our um, our peace in this great building that we have to construct. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going to hear from all of you that are listening tight um, and launch our last poll of the day to hear what are the commitments that are aligned most with your institutions or organizations, your interventions, goals, and your mission? Um, that poll should be in front of you now. We want to hear from you about the commitments that you think you have a sphere of influence around. Please go ahead and vote. Thank you all for selecting those commitments. If I could see the results now. Great. Overwhelmingly, we have one on promoting women's political participation that gets 49%. So a lot of folks here are able to have that kind of commitment um, and that sphere of influence. Another 46%. 6% have a sphere of influence around funding feminist movements. So hopefully as after this and between now and the Paris Forum, we'll see increased commitments around promoting women's political participation and increased commitments for funding feminist movements. Thank you all so much for voting and for listening tight. We have many questions from you all too many for the last 10 minutes that we have to wrap up. So um, I'm going to mention just a few and I'm going to ask the speakers to just give us one last inspirational push and respond in any way you can to some of the questions that have come in. Um, as I mentioned, there was the one question on what would we say that the role of feminist elders who are no longer in leadership positions at this moment. Um, there is another question, also a generational question. How are young feminists ensuring that they avoid some of the mistakes of older feminists in their movement building to be more global, inclusive, and ensure that those with more privilege do not dominate agendas, resources, and platforms? Um, and then, uh, Last question around the religious sector, um, which has been statistically shown to resist leadership. Um, as we walk to achieving gender parity and full participation of women in leadership and decision making, how do we address the way women can undermine women? I know that's often the question that we hear um, and maybe speaks to some of the questions around how do we transform patriarchy from within, within ourselves as individuals, our institutions, and then the large? Um, so over to you all for your closing remarks, and thank you very much for everything that you've brought. Um, I will call on you as you are shy. So, uh, uh, Ksenia, would you like to go first? <laughs> sure. So, um, maybe I can take the questions for the um, feminist elders, all because I've spoken about young feminist engagement a lot. Um, I hope that we, we are not having the dialogue in the form where it's like young feminists against older feminists, but more um, be aligned. I don't like the framing otherwise. Um, coming from a family that is very feminist, I um, and having many amazing women and in, in former generations, this is a very important topic for me. I think. Uh, creating community and I think acknowledging the healing that is happening from one generation to another and really having the yeah tapping into this wisdom and knowledge that is embedded also intergenerationally I think that's a very uh, nice thing to do getting a lot of strength from it and I would say leadership is like 
doesn't have to be a position of leadership. I think that takes space in all time, uh, place in all times, types of forms. And um, maybe as one last thing, encouraging thing, or one message from today that I wanted to share is really, is, I'm saying this a lot, but asking everyone when we do this transformative work to lean into feeling uncomfortable because doing things differently is very uncomfortable and just acknowledging that and then leaning into it. Um, that is what I really um, hope to see from all stakeholders involved. Thank you. Thank and thank you, thank you for Ksenia. this wonderful moderation, Hakima. <laughs> and I, I hear you, there is a role for everybody in the feminist movements and in feminist leadership, wherever you are. Shamiso, can I go to you next? Okay, um, thank you, um, Hakima, and really great um, job moderating the session. Um, I think um, definitely intergenerational, not, you know, um, mentorship is a big, is a big one for me. I think definitely in terms of, you know, the passing on, you know, and what role previous, you know, the older generation of feminists play, definitely that's, that is definitely key, I think. Um, but I think also just in terms of something to take away um, is, you know, how do, what yardstick do we bring about in terms of measuring thinking, right? How do we measure attitude change? How do we measure thinking? And I think that's what we're trying to do when we talk about just, you know, effective participation or transformative, you know, um, change in, in women and men and just the patriarchal systems that exist, right? The yardstick that measures a change in thinking. And I think that's my takeaway for everyone that how do we begin besides just the numbers and the percentages what measure do we use? Um, yeah, just in terms of that. And thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Um, We have very little time left, but can I go to you, Kitty, for your last remarks? Well, Hakima, I could speak for another hour, but I won't. Uh, but let me say something about, about the elders, because that's a generation that I'm afraid I'm closer to, though I'm young at heart. Um, Look, I, I, I think elder feminists can hopefully be uh, a source of inspiration, can hopefully do the intergenerational coaching that has just been referenced, but it should be very clear that we grew up in a different world. And we need the world of the future of young feminists to be even very different than the world they live in now and their daughters need to live in. 130 years to achieve gender parity is a very long time. So we need to accelerate, we need to go fast, and I think what the elder generation, such as myself, can do, we can't build the future for young people, but we can build young people for their future, enable them, uh, fund them. And so again, let's make sure that young people that are sometimes differently organized, as was mentioned in network groupings, that the way we enable them, including through our funding, which sometimes is difficult even for me because my fiduciary norms are tough, um, but that we enable them to speak, to talk, to take and claim their seat so that they can create and mold the future that they want. And one last word, I do believe religious leaders are incredibly important. They're almost exclusively male, but they do hold a lot of power. And the, we have had instances to have behind closed doors incredibly difficult, but incredibly productive conversations around sexual and reproductive health and rights with religious leaders from all walks of life. I, I do believe if we do not invest in religious leaders, it is very difficult to change societal norms. It's slow, it's hard slog, but it's absolutely important. And, you know, power to the young and power to the feminists from the South, because without them, the world just won't change. So back to you. Thank you so much, Kitty. Uh, Veronica, and then I will go to Cynthia. Thank you, thank you very much, Akim. I think my task is easy because a lot has been said. Um, what to say? I think there's no ex expiry date or you know entry into force date for being a feminist, of course. Um, and I think others have said it, um, it is critical to have uh, an intergenerational dialogue and intergenerational uh, mentorship, especially at this point in time when you know the challenges that we are facing are so important and 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 so big. 
And you know, we have uh, talked a lot about the obstacles and, and the difficulties that the feminist movement and feminist activists are facing uh, today, but um, they are still um, active, but we are still active and, and mobilizing. And according to you know, a very recent report by UN Women, since March last year, there have been around 3,000 women-led protests uh, around uh, the world. And this is in spite of you know, lockdown measures and uh, risks of infection. So it shows really the, the urgency um, of feminist demands um, because we are a, a, at a critical uh, juncture, you know, the, 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 the post-COVID-19 uh, recovery offers um, an opportunity, an unprecedented opportunity to, to change and to challenge economic and social models that are built on and based on, on exclusion and, and inequality. So as a feminist, um, it is heartening to see our mobilization in the streets and, and online. And I think the launch of this action coalition comes at a truly opportune moment. And to conclude, I just want to encourage everyone to join us to make transformative commitments and support our collective vision for a more equal, just and a happier world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. Cynthia, in one sentence, what do you want to leave this audience with? To promote young uh, women to uh, be involved as parliamentarians. This cause is close to my heart. Uh, women and girls have much to contribute to decision making, but having a seat at the table does not come easy, but it's a difference. So I will um, try to uh, say that they need to fight for a seat. They need to be in politics because only we can change the things if we are in the decision-making process and in the in the decision-making um, seats. If not, it's so difficult to change something. So I think that we need more leaders, we need more women at these seats, at leader positions. So I will say to young women to, to begin, I, 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 as I have told you, I began when I was 21, I'm 34, and it's the fourth time that I am legislator in Mexico. So yes, we can, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we can promote this young participation to women that go to the seat and fight for others. So we need your voice. We need it in all the world. And thank you so much for being in my country, Mexico. I am very happy to receive you, even though it's virtually. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for those powerful words from all of you and for being so inspiring and holding us today and for the really strong message for feminist movements and feminist leadership to be well-resourced, to be sustained, to be intergenerational intersectional and really to be protected as well and have the mechanisms for that protection. Thank you so much to all of you and to all of the translators who have stuck with us, including the sign interpretation. Thank you to the graphic um, recorder who has made this beautiful image that you see of our conversation. I'm gonna pass now back over to Hannah to close us up. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Akima, and what an interesting conversation this has been. Thank you so much for framing the Action Coalition of Feminist Movement and Leadership with such a power. From a personal point of view, having been a young activist myself uh, and in politics as a minister and, and parliamentarian and mayor for a long time, it was super encouraging to listen to all of you and hear about the solutions that are being offered within this Action Coalition of Feminist Movement and Leadership. I'm just going to draw it to a close, Akim, just by if you would pull up the slide where we would like to leave you uh, with what is ahead, because there is one thing that we are talking about, the draft blueprint that is in place now and the actions that we have, but where we would really like for our audience to place themselves and think about and make sure that they spread the world, uh, uh, ar the word around the world is that now we are moving into the real commitments. 
uh, on the grounds of these actions that have been introduced by the great leaders of this action coalition, we would like to see the world moving into making commitments and the path from Mexico and thanks, all our great thanks and gratitude goes of course to Mexico that has done an amazing job on hosting all of this. We now move to the road from Mexico to Paris and the government of Paris is as well preparing a really great event, the Generation Equality Forum this summer in Paris. And in between these two great uh, forums, we aim to collect commitments. And we want people to sit down, individual institutions, governments, civil society, youth-led organization, member states and the private sector with the multi-stakeholder commitment in place, sitting down and making sure that they commit to the future and for changing the world for all women and girls. If we look at the next slide, and all of these slides, dear friends from around the world, you can see and, and uh, gather uh, in the booth that is the exhibition booth of this forum, so you can see all these documents if you need for them to be better detailed or outlined. Uh, but this is where we outline how one can become a commitment maker. And we are always talking about the commitments that we want to see. We want to see bold and transformative commitments to one or several action coalition. I mean, some of you here today might want to commit, commit around the leadership and feminist movement. Others might want to commit around some other action coalition. And many are doing this for one or several action coalitions. Uh, we want the commitment makers to play a catalytic role in supporting the implementation and monitoring of actions that have been laid forward by the leaders. And then we expect our commitment makers to mobilize other stakeholders around the action coalition theme and blueprint. That is spreading the word and making sure that we get as many commitments and as well funded and as well placed as possible. But who can become a commitment maker? And this answer is super simple. Everyone can and everyone should. So there is no sort of, uh, there is no real barrier around that. Everyone should and everyone can. But well, what is expected? Because we have been asked a lot because the leaders of the Action Coalition make of course a great commitment and are solely committed to this for five years. Our commitment makers do not, they of course we are hoping for financial commitments because as has been mentioned in this group here, this cannot happen unless we make financial commitments. But there is also a place for advocacy commitments, policy commitments and programmatic commitments. And in the end, dear friends, the commitments should be game changing, measurable and ideally they should be exactly along the lines that you have heard here today. You've heard people from governments, you've heard people from parliaments, you've heard people from private sector inst inst international institutions, you've heard from youth-led organization and civil society that are working together. So ideally they should be designed around and with other stakeholders. So this is what we are really hoping to see between Paris, between Mexico and Paris, and of course, for the five, five years that the Action Coalition will be with us. We would also like to end on the note that is so important. In the end, I would like to thank everybody involved and thanks for the really gorgeous uh, graphic facilitation that we have seen that would also be shared with you. Thanks for the encouragement that have been with us, but rest assured that we will be continuing and please make sure that we do this in the line of the mission of the Generation Equality Forum to be respectful of the generations, to be respectful of different views and make sure that we can in partnership change the world for women and girls around the world. Over and out, Takima, and thank you so much for great facilitation. Thank you so much, Hannah, for telling us exactly how to make commitments and what to do next. So thank you all for joining us and staying with us during this hour. Again, thank you to everyone behind the scenes who have made this happen. Um, and thank you all for listening. Goodbye.